Hi, I'm Tom Long, and today's beach meditation, well, it's not taking place on the beach. It is really cold out there. Uh, this coming Sunday is the second Sunday of Epiphany in uh, the lectionary, and the first reading for tomorrow is taken from Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 through 7. And I will include a link uh, to that passage in the description below. So that's what we're going to be looking at during our time together in this uh, video. Assuming that you have read, uh, you, you know, just, and if you haven't, just pause the video. Go to Isaiah 49, verses 1 through 7, and read that. Assuming that you did that, uh, the question that comes up as you go through this passage is, who is the servant that Isaiah is referring to in these seven verses? And there's been a lot of different ideas about what that uh, might, might mean, but uh, in this particular passage, sometimes the servant is identified as Judah, sometimes as Israel, and of course, um, many people assume that it is talking, uh, since it's talking in the first person, that Isaiah is talking about himself. And verse 1 begins by describing the servant as having been named before he was even born. And what's interesting is that uh, Jesus was actually named Jesus before he was even born. So uh, as you would see in Matthew chapter 1, verses 21 and 25, Jesus was pre-named. I don't know if you'd, <laughs> if you'd put it that way, but in fact, his name was given before he was born. And, um, and of course, that is seen as quite an honor when you look at uh, uh, the history of the Old and New Testaments. But the servant is frustrated. So he recognizes that he's in a position of honor, but he's frustrated by the lack of fruit that his ministry bears. Um, so it, it, as in, it doesn't seem to be bearing any fruit. So he talks about, for example, how God made him to be a sharp sword, but he says that sword is hidden in his hand. It's not, and no, nobody else can see it. It's hidden away. And then he says he's, that he's like a, uh, you know, a polished arrow. Oh, but that arrow, it's hidden away in a quiver. No one can see it. It's not getting anything done. And he goes on to say God had promised to display his splendor in the servant. But the servant then responds in our passage to what God has said and says, you know what? I don't have any, you said you were going to display your splendor, but I look at what I've been able to do and it looks like I've done nothing. It's all been in vain. And uh, I think personally, and not just myself, but many servants of the Lord <clears throat> look at what is happening, the, you know, the fruit of their ministry. And they think, I, I'm out here, I'm trying to be faithful. You know, it's like the the uh, parable of the sower of the seed. I'm out here, I'm sowing the seed, I'm casting the seed uh, out on the ground, but it just seems like it's only landing in the rocky and shallow soil. There's not a lot to show for for what I'm doing. And so he recognize, recognizes his call, but at the same time, He's not seeing that he's living up to the potential of what it was that he was called to do. But then God answers the servant, saying that though the return of God's people may have been underwhelming to the servant. So at this point in history, the, uh, the people of Israel are being called back from captivity in Babylon from from far islands and far nations. They're coming back to uh, Israel. <clears throat> and God answers the servant that, said, that and he says, that's not, that's not even all of it. Not only is God going to restore the people of Jacob, the descendants of Abraham, but will also make the servant, quote, 
a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So now, you know, the, the servant had been focused on my people, people like me. This is, you know, I'm not, I'm not having any effect on people like me. And God says, hey, you're not just going to have an impact on people like you. My vision's bigger than your vision. My vision includes the Gentiles. It includes the nations. I plan on gathering from all nations, all people, all groups of people. I plan on gathering all of them to myself. And so this looks forward to, it, it uh, presages what's going to happen when Jesus comes and, and he makes those same exact claims that he has come to save the nations and that we're to make disciples of all nations. But God goes on in this passage and he recognizes what, uh, what has discouraged the servant because he says that uh, the servant was despised by the nation and even the servant of rulers. So not just kings, not just rulers, but the ruler's servants were despising the servant. But, he says, there is a future in which, quote, kings will see you and stand up. And when I read that this week, the image that came into my mind, having just come out of uh, the season of uh, Advent, of Christmas, um, growing up, I sang in a church choir, and um, at Christmas time, we would do Handel's Messiah. And the story goes, and let me uh, get, the, get the date here right, in 1743, 60-year-old uh, King George II uh, went to hear the premiere. So, you know, you think about Hollywood and the red carpet events and all of that when a new movie premieres and the stars are there and all of that. Well, here's George II who's come and, you know, there's not going to be anybody more important, more famous, greater statue than than King George II that is attending this uh, gala event. And now we come to the Hallelujah Chorus during the premiere of Handel's Messiah and the king, the 60-year-old man, when they start singing, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, when they start singing that, King George rises up out of his seat, moved by the awesome majesty of Christ the King. And although that was a literal and perhaps not historical, that may be a mythological story, but that's how that tradition began that we all stand during the Hallelujah Chorus. Though that was a specific literal example of a king standing up in honor of God's servant, many kings around the world and through history have stood up to honor Jesus Christ, had to honor the king, to honor the servant. And so the tables turn, don't they? But that isn't, of course, the end of the story. I mean, as we think about it, and this is uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Sunday, as we think about it, we have yet to realize what it means for all people, every race, every nation, every person, every group of people within the world, all tribes and all languages. Um, I, I get so discouraged sometimes when I, I hear people complaining about, oh, they're not talking. My, I was in the grocery store and these people were talking Spanish. They weren't talking my language. And it's like, so what? So what? God isn't calling just you English-speaking people to himself. He's calling the Russian-speaking people. He's calling the Spanish-speaking people, the English-speaking, the French-speaking, the, uh, 
the different tribal tongues of Africa, no matter what your tongue is, no matter what your race is, no matter what your nation is, God came for you. That's the promise that Martin Luther King Jr., that's the dream that he could see, this coming reality. But let's face it, we're not there. Uh, have we made some progress? Of course we have. I mean, you can look at the, the United States history as an example, but I think you could look around the world because, um, you know, we had, there was a time when we had slaves. One of the reasons that the Vikings dispersed across uh, the planet was in order to gather together slaves to bring back to Scandinavia. So, uh, and, and African tribes gathered slaves to one another. I mean, there's been a long history of this kind of oppression and abuse. And, uh, and at least nowadays, in, in the civilized world, that's all illegal. And so, you know, in the United States, we made, we took a step forward and we had the Emancipation Proclamation. And then we took a step back. We had the Jim Crow laws. And then we took a step forward and we had the Civil Rights Movement. And now we seem to be taking another step back and trying to limit the democratic power in my country that uh, non-whites would have uh, in voting in our democratic uh, process. And so you have all of this going on, this push pull and it mimics what happened in the history of Israel. You know, God called Abraham to go to a land that he knew not of. And so he goes and then out of disobedience, he ends up being uh, um, uh, exiled to Egypt where he's enslaved. And then God sets his people free and they come to the promised land. Uh, you know, they go through the wilderness uh, to the promised land, but then there's uh, the Babylonian captivity, and then they're gathered back to Israel. And then there's th this dispersion into Europe. And because of the uh, horrible acts of Nazi Germany, and I'm of German descent, and, and, but I, I will say they were just horrible acts. Um, there was a new movement to establish what we now think of as the country of Israel. And so there's been this kind of loop-de-loo thing going on throughout history where we make progress toward the coming of the kingdom and then we fall back. We never fully realize in this life the full promise of what it is that Jesus came to bring us, the kingdom of God. We never fully realize that, and we won't fully realize that until that day in which uh, Jesus Christ will be fully revealed, as it uh, says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, that on that day Jesus Christ is going to be fu fully revealed, and as John says in uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, <clears throat> that on that day, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So right now, the kingdom has broken into the world. God is gifting his people. God is <clears throat> calling his people to bear the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Uh, God is calling us to be a loving, welcoming people, bringing people together from all over the world, from every group of people united in their acceptance of the reign of the King Jesus. But we don't fully realize that reign, and we won't fully realize that reign until the day of the Lord comes and we see Jesus face to face, and we become like him, for we shall see him as he is. And so... That's why um, when you look at, uh, <clears throat> let me just jump down here to Psalm 40, uh, verse 1, where the psalmist says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He didn't just wait. He waited patiently. That's where we are right now. We, the kingdom has come. Whenever God draw someone to himself. Whenever God transforms us into people who are loving and welcoming instead of dividing and scattering, whenever God 
acts in us in that way, the kingdom is breaking in, but it's never fully realized until the day of the Lord comes and we see him face to face. Oh, what a glorious day that will be. May God bless you and add his understanding to the hearing of his word. Thank you for joining me today.